Okay, so today we're going to talk about um, basically the online world, uh, architecture, design, and the online world. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about websites, personal landing pages, and that sort of thing. We're also going to do a little bit of um, resume work via your LinkedIn profile uh, and that sort of thing. And, and I'll kind of talk through that. Today will be the last day of kind of the uh, non-directly focused Photoshop, InDesign, Illustrator, learn the software days. Though I think this kind of a day is really important because I think it's something that uh, if you don't start dealing with now, will become a problem much later on. Um, and so if we start working on it now, it starts to make your content easy uh, and you've already developed an online presence. Uh, presence. So uh, we're going to talk about it today. Next week on Monday, right? you don't get Monday off next week. Uh, we, we start normal schedule. Uh, if you have a digital camera, bring it with you. We're going to talk about digital photography. We'll talk about cameras. We'll talk about, um, you know, basic shooting. Hopefully, it won't be a day quite like today. Um, it's, it's always hard because it's a morning class, but I'm going to ask you to go out and take some pictures uh, as part of your exercise portion uh, of the class. So you'll be, I'll lecture in the beginning, and then you'll be free to go take pictures um, and do what you want. If it's a really poor weather day, uh, you'll have to do it on your own time some other time. Um, but I'll ask you for a variety of pictures. We'll talk about what aperture means and shutter speed and all that sort of thing. So that we're prepared when it comes time to Photoshop, you have some images to work with, which is the whole point. Okay. So anyway, bring a digital camera if you have one um, on Monday. If not, at least bring your cell phone because you can get a long way uh, with just your cell phone. Um, but all that's for next week. Uh, today we're going to start talking about how the internet works in general. Anybody know how the internet works? A few people. You want to take a stab at it? You don't have to. Yes, exactly. That is a very, very good answer. Probably the best answer I've ever gotten out of somebody. So basically what it is is it's a bunch of computers that we call servers that are scattered around the U.S., around the world, and those computers host all the content that we look at. Uh, and unfortunately, we need some way of accessing it, and we've come up with something that's called the DNS system. Uh, and basically what that translates to is... It's like kind of like a phone book. Not that any of you would know what a phone book is anymore because we don't use phone books. Uh, I get one delivered and it goes directly in the recycle bin, but whatever. I don't even know why they bother. But it's kind of like that. Basically what it does is it translates a name, which is a domain name, into the physical address of the computer that's hosting the information. Uh, and I'm trying to simplify this. It's usually a group of computers that are hosting the information, but we'll just pretend that it's a very... Uh, Straightforward thing. Basically, if you go to Wikipedia, you need some way of changing Wikipedia into a numeric series, which is an IP address, of where that computer exists in the world of the Internet. Right? So when we're trying to connect to Wikipedia, or when you're trying to connect to the digital tool server, right, that computer is somewhere. Right? In the digital tools world, um, my website is hosted out of Florida. Uh, and it's in the Federal Reserve Building in Jacksonville, Florida. That's, that's where the computer exists that hosts the Digital Tools website. When you upload stuff, it goes to Florida, basically. But you guys need some way of translating. You don't need to remember that it's uh, 162.220.8.188 is the IP address for that. Actually, I think I changed the, the address. But anyway, you don't need to remember that because it's too much information. So you need something like this that cross-references, right? You type in digital tools for architects and it takes you to that server. That's the idea, okay? So then you need some way of accessing the internet. And so we've developed this thing called the web browser, right? And this has taken a lot of evolution and some of you will remember back to the early stages of dial-up and the first web browsers and that sort of thing. Some of you have no clue what we're talking about, right? In the old days, it was really, really slow, and you were kind of stuck with, like, the AOL browser or whatever, or the CompuServe, I think that was one back in the day, right? But things have evolved, right? Then we all started using Internet Explorer, which was the branded Microsoft browser. Then we all started to get smart and stopped using that and started using something else. Uh, we went into the world of Firefox, a lot of us, for a while. Then that got really bloated and slow, and then Google came along and said, here's Chrome, and it's a whole lot better, 
Uh, meanwhile, Apple developed, you know, based on the same technology, their Safari browser. So all the Apple people said, oh, screw the rest of them, we're going to use Safari. Uh, and some people still use Internet Explorer. Whatever, right? Um, so there, there's another browser out there called Opera. Most people have never even heard of it, but it does exist. Uh, so I include it. So what do we need to know about the web browser? Basically, the web browser is the way in which we access the content of the Internet. Um, unfortunately, over time, some things have been discovered that allow malicious activities to be shuttled into your computer. Uh, and for a while, some companies had some dangerous technology built into browsers. Uh, the most uh, prominent example is a technology called ActiveX that Microsoft developed. Uh, they developed it so that you could allow Microsoft to update your computer. You went into Internet Explorer, you said, let me do a Windows update. Microsoft said, great, here's the new software, we'll install it on your computer. The problem was, people learned that code, put it in their websites, and installed stuff on your computer that you didn't want installed. Um, so it ended up being kind of a dangerous technology. It's been stripped out, it still works, sometimes you have to give permission. Um, there's little pop-ups that happen. There is still always the challenge of you saying okay when you really shouldn't say okay or you typing in your password when you really shouldn't type in your password. Uh, but for the most part, it's a lot more secure than it used to be, right? There are also a variety of plugins that you can run that can help uh, your web browsing from blocking ads. Um, there's web developer plugins where you can see code, you can see how people have written uh, websites, that sort of thing. Right? The, other, the other factor in it is how fast is the browser, how stable is the browser, does it crash a lot, does it not? Uh, generally, we've all moved into the world of Chrome, which is built on WebKit, which is generally a very stable uh, web platform. So that's just background information. So let's talk a little bit about Wi-Fi, um, because I think it's getting to the point where Wi-Fi is everywhere, and we're so used to it that we don't think about it, and we don't really... Um, concern ourselves with what we're doing online when we're on some unsecure public network. So what do we need to talk about that? Okay? If I go to Starbucks and I open up my computer, their network is not a secure network. Right? Somebody sitting next to me with some hacking tools could theoretically look at my information, look at my computer, depending on my settings. Right? And this is something that's a big uh, problem here at DVC as well. Uh, a lot of you hop on DVC Wi-Fi. Anybody ever notice when they jump onto DVC Wi-Fi, uh, their, their share group of all the computers that are sharing information show up? Anybody ever notice that before? Right? On my computer, it pops right up because I, have, I share information when I'm on my home network. And at any point in time when I'm logged in here in the ET building, there are somewhere between 10 and 15 computers that are sharing information or have enabled sharing access for other people to access files that they have on their computer. Okay? That by itself is not a particularly secure thing because if I were a malicious hacker person, right, which I'm not, so you're all safe from me at least, <laughs> if I were that kind of a person, right, I could maliciously put something on your computer that might infect it with a virus, that might do something to it, right, because you didn't secure your computer. And so that's something to be very aware of. If you're on your home network, right, it's behind a password, you can share files, you can share stuff between your computers, you can have them all wide open because you're inside your house. But when you move outside and you're in a public network, you have to be really careful. You have to be conscious. Okay? Um, the thing about this is no matter whether you're at a bank you're, you're, or, excuse me, no matter whether you're at Starbucks or you're here, if you connect to a secure server, so let's say you connect to your bank, right? what you submit to your bank isn't going to be seen by anybody. It's using something called SSL to encrypt the connection. Okay? You guys ever noticed in your web browser like a little lock icon that shows up or something turns green? Right, when you log into your bank or something like that, right, that means it's an SSL connection. It's actually encrypted and secure. You have no risk of passwords being seen and whatever. The, the problem is the bulk of the websites that you go to don't have that. Right? Uh, even like Google doesn't have it. When you log into Gmail, it is secure. So there's, there's places where it's secure. There's places where it's not. You just want to be aware. Right? And a lot of times you aren't aware, so I'm trying to um, make you aware. Okay, I'm guessing that almost all of you, if not all of you, have Wi-Fi at home. How many people have never changed the default name of the, uh, it's called the SSID? Um, how many people have never changed that name? It still says Linksys or, you know, whatever the AT&T U-verse is or Comcast, right? How many people have not changed it? Okay, how many people have not changed the router password from whatever the default is? 
Okay. So all of you are a great example, right? And this is why things like companies like Comcast and AT&T have started trying to, on the bottom of the router, they put their own password and stuff in that's a custom, right? In the old days, you had a router, you bought it from Linksys, there was a default password, right? The login was admin, the password was admin, right? On Netgear, the login was uh, admin and the password was password, I think, right? So there were some defaults, and guess what? Those are known. You can Google search. What are the, you know? It's a Linksys WRT160N. What's the default password on it, right? Or whatever. Given that information, somebody can go into your router and change the settings and configure things, put some key loggers in, right? Log information, that sort of thing. If your computer is unsecure, right? Or if your network is unsecure. So first thing to do is to change the name, right, of your Wi-Fi network. That would help. Right? Second thing to do is to make sure that there is a password on it. Right? It's a little bit more cumbersome the first time you have a new computer or a phone or an iPad or whatever to have to type in that password. You do it once, your computer stores it, it's not a big deal after that. But at least it's then a secure network. You have your friend come over, you have your girlfriend come over, you have your boyfriend come over, you have to give them the password. It's a little annoying, but once you do that, it makes life a whole lot easier. Your network is secure, you can share files inside, that sort of thing is not a problem anymore. Okay, so please secure it. Um, there is a new WPA encryption. That's the, the most secure right now. There was a WEP encryption that has been superseded because somebody figured out how to hack it, right? So basically in the world of security, there's always solutions and then there's people that try to break the solutions and then they come up with new solutions and then people try to break the new solutions, right? And that's the way it works. Um, so if you're really concerned about privacy and online, um, you can purchase what's called a VPN or a virtual private network. Uh, and this depends on your level of paranoia. Uh, some people are more paranoid than others. Uh, some people do less than uh, legal activities online. Some people don't. Uh, you have to kind of decide what's right for you and what is your preferred level of anonymity. How do you say that? Yeah, it's, it's being anonymous, but I can't figure out the correct word. Anyway, sorry. So something like this is it's called a virtual private network. And basically what it says, and sometimes you would use this if you worked for a big corporation and you needed to get from your home inside the big corporation. Um, what this is doing is it's creating an encrypted private connection to a particular company. right? And then through that connection, you can then access the internet. So it's basically encrypting from you to the company. And so if you if you pay for a service like this, uh, sometimes it's an uh, anonymizer right, service, basically to make you anonymous, you pay to make an encrypted connection to that company, and then beyond that company you can access the internet, but that company is masking who you are as an individual. Right? So let's say that you were uh, a political activist, and you really didn't want people uh, or the government knowing what your business was and what kind of Google searches you were making and, and whatever, right? You might pay for a service like this to protect your identity and not let, you know, uh, the president know what you were doing, right? I'm not saying this is necessarily for something illegal, but there are a lot of things like Walmart tracks what you purchase so that they know, um, you know, where to serve certain ads and what kinds of uh, goods to stock in a certain environment. And so they track a lot of personal information, right? So let's say you were interested in purchasing guns, but you didn't really want anybody to know that you were interested in doing that, right? Sounds, everything I, every example I come up with sounds really bad, right? I'm not trying to make it bad. Let's say you were trying to stockpile food, right? Because you were afraid that the zombie apocalypse was coming, right? You might not want everybody to know that you were doing it because you were trying to do it privately. You didn't want to create a, a super demand for that food, right? This is the kind of thing that would allow you to do that. Okay. All this being said, right? In, if, if the NSA really wants to know what you're doing, they're going to know what you're doing. It doesn't matter what you do. right? They have computers powerful enough to get through and to see whatever you're doing. So I'm not saying by any means that it's 100% you know, clear, but it's a lot better. Anyway, um, I'm going to show you guys a little video that kind of illustrates this. But this is the graphic that says, at, at your normal activity level, you have your computer, you go unencrypted out to the internet, somebody theoretically could be watching you, right? If you use a, a, a VPN service, right, you're encrypted to the company, and then outside of there, nobody knows who you are, theoretically. 
So I have a little video. Isn't Wi-Fi great? You can browse the web anywhere, coffee shops, airports, libraries, but using public Wi-Fi means that people can spy on you and it's as easy as, yep, they can access your data at the touch of a button. Seriously, even your internet service provider can see every website you ever go to. Private internet access has got your back. How? Well, it's kind of nerdy, but to put it simply, spies and companies that track you don't like us one bit. We create an encrypted tunnel so that nobody can spy on you. We also provide IP cloaking, which frees you from geographic restrictions when you're traveling. Register today and disappear online, the way it was supposed to be. So obviously it was an advertisement, so they're trying to sell a product, but at the same time they point out some of the services that are available. The other thing that happens, um, Spotify is now in the US, but you remember, maybe you don't, but uh, when it originally came out it was only in the UK. And a lot of people in the U.S. wanted access to Spotify because they wanted that service, right? Something that a, a VPN service can offer you is the ability to change where your internet traffic is coming out of to be somewhere else. So I could be in California, but through this VPN, I could be coming out in the U.K. and have access to the BBC or something that I wouldn't normally have access to. So I can shift my geographic location. That's what they were talking about. So sometimes this kind of service is, is pretty good. I'll use one other example that's not a malicious example, right? Um, my father-in-law lives the bulk of the time down in Ecuador. And he was having a really hard time accessing his AT&T email that he has from home here down there, right? It kept blocking him. It kept kicking him out. It kept resetting his password and whatever. And I said, hey, why don't you buy a VPN service like this? to allow yourself to connect as if you were in California, in which case you can check your email and not have a problem from a foreign country, right? So it worked really well for him. He now can access his email without a problem. So there are legal good reasons to be doing this, but I at least want to bring it up to you, okay? So the next thing, and then I'll be done with my doom and gloom for the day, right, is passwords, okay? Uh, this is something that I hope will really, really scare you, right? That is my intent right now. Uh, because you're not, well, very few of you are uh, strong enough in this area to be protected, right? So, uh, as of last fall, uh, there was a group of Russian hackers that were able to get 1.2 billion passwords, okay? That's a lot of passwords, okay? Chances are, in that 1.2 billion, whether you are part of the hacked group or not, your password has been discovered, right? Whatever it is, the name of your dog, um, you know, the name of the place you went hiking, the, your birthday, right? All of that information is out there and has been used before by somebody else, right? Unless you made up some random word, okay? Uh, this is a problem, right? On average, statistically, uh, you guys have 27 online accounts, right? I actually have way more because I started tracking this, right? You have, on average, 27 online accounts and you use about six and a half passwords to access those 27 accounts, right? So you're repeating passwords, which is a big problem, right? And the passwords tend to be rather simple for all of these, right? Most normal passwords can be cracked in about 90 seconds, given normal computing power, okay? So if you use uh, my, my, my mother-in-law, I'm picking on my in-laws today, right? My mother-in-law uses the classic password of her dog's name, and then like one, two, three, four, five, six, or, you know, something like that, okay? that sort of a password is really, really easy to crack. Really easy, right? And people have developed software programs that know what the normal patterns we use for passwords are, right? So a word plus a date, a word plus some one, two, three, four, five, six, right, are known patterns. They're things that we know people use for passwords. It makes it really easy to crack those, okay? So as we get faster and faster computers, we get faster and faster faster ability to crack passwords, okay? So if, you're, if you have a PC that's running a single uh, Radon GPU, which is a graphics card processor, those are faster than the, uh, like the um, you know, core processors that are in the computer. The graphics cards tend to be a little bit faster for this, right? If it's running this GPU, right, it can try an average of 8.2 billion password combinations per second, right? So, it doesn't take too long to crack. You can see how fast these computers are getting, 
right? The more passwords that are, that are cracked or leaked, you guys hear about these, oh, there was a security breach at Home Depot. Oh, there was a security breach on LinkedIn. Oh, Facebook leaked a bunch of passwords, right? You guys hear this happening in the news, right? And most of you say, oh, whatever, right? I wasn't part of that group or whatever. The problem is that it, you might not have been part of that group, right? But the words that you use in your password, right, were part of somebody else's password in all likelihood that are part of that group. So what the hackers have done is they've developed basically a dictionary of these are all the words people tend to use in a password, and if we're trying to crack your password, we're going to do that first rather than second, okay? So another example of this sort of thing, um, you guys know that I, I own the server that hosts the digital tool site, and I actually own another server, okay? I would say two or three times a day, if not more, I get an email from my server, because I have it set up to do this, saying that I've blocked and blacklisted somebody who's tried to hack my server. Okay, two or three times a day, somebody's doing that to my server. So you can imagine on a, on a big site, right, that this stuff is happening all the time. They're always trying to crack your passwords, right? And so this is something you want to be very, very aware of. Okay, so here's an example of one of these computers. These are not sexy looking computers by any means, but this is a password cracking computer. This is what it's done. It has 12 or eight of those, uh, it's $12,000. It has eight of those GPU cards in it, right? Um, and it, this is the software that it's running. It can brute force, which means it tries every combination of letters and numbers, right? An eight character password, so eight characters long, right? In 12 hours. So even if you had random, completely random, you just went like on the keyboard, right, for your password, this computer can crack that password in 12 hours if it's eight characters long, okay? Each time you add a character, right, it gets that much harder, right? So before long, if you have a long password, it gets pretty impossible to crack, right? But that tells you how easy it is right now to crack a password, okay? So there are also tricks that we all use in our passwords that really don't work anymore because the hackers know about them, right? Not a surprise, okay? So if you write a word forward and then backward, right? Mustache forward and backwards. I could never use this because I could never spell mustache, especially backwards. But anyway, uh, if you did something like this, right? That's easy. That's a pattern. We can recognize that pattern, right? If you substitute letters for numbers, right? You substitute threes for E's or something like that. That's, that's a known password. Right? So if you use super right, with a 3 in it, right, that's just like using super all lowercase. It's just like using super with a capital S. Right? It's a known combination, something that they can uh, find really easily. Right? So these kinds of strategies really don't work well. So OMG, I'm screwed. Right? So what do you do? Okay, how do you fix this problem? You don't use the same password twice. Okay, which is really problematic because we all use the same passwords over and over again, right? Uh, you use a password that contains numbers, letters, and symbols if the website will allow you to use symbols, right? It increases the number of characters, the number of different characters, right? 26 letters, right? 10 numbers, and then however many symbols there are. I don't even know, <coughs> right? Increased number uh, combinations that you can do, right? And you really want to make the password random. The more random, the better. Okay, so now this involves a big problem in that I can never remember the password, right, if I use something like this. So what do we do? The only real way around this is to use a password manager. Anybody use a password manager? No? Right? right. Some people use, have, have just a list of their passwords that they write down, right, that works. I would encourage you to explore something like this. I really think this is a good product. Um, the one that I use is called 1Password. It's the first one listed here. It's a rather expensive, but it's a one-time fee. You pay for it, and it's over, and you, you, you don't have to pay anymore. Some of them are subscription-based, where you pay a certain amount per year um, for, for certain services. So what it does right, is it helps you in a variety of ways. It's a little piece of software that, like this that runs on your computer, and it automatically records passwords. Right? So you can start by just recording your passwords so you don't have to remember them, which helps. Right? But the other thing that it will do is it will generate a password for you. Right? So it stores the passwords encrypted so that somebody can't hack in and see them. You have to have a, a master password, which I would encourage you to do something very complicated for your master password. You have to remember that one, unfortunately. So there's always one that you have to remember. Right? It will integrate both into your operating system. So if you're running Safari, you're running Chrome, whatever, it'll integrate right into that. Right? Ideally, it will integrate into your phone. 
right? So that if you need a password, you can get it from your phone, right? And if this is something you're really interested in, you want to see me do it on my phone, I'm happy to show you uh, how I use it, right? The other thing is when you're registering for a site or when you're changing your password, it will create for you a completely random string of numbers, letters, and symbols as long as you want that you can then use as your password. So you don't have to come up with a random password, it will actually create it. Um, it will also create a separate password for every online account that you have, right? So you're never repeating a password. Um, and it, it, like I said, it will have a mobile version for your phone or your iPad or whatever and a desktop version that works with your computer. Now the one place that this breaks down in reality, it's really easy, once you get used to it, it's really easy to use it on your computer, it's really easy to use it on your phone. I use it without a problem. Uh, I have something like 200 internet accounts, which is kind of scary, but I know that because it keeps track of them all for me. Um, works really easily, keeps track of all my passwords, I have no problem with it. However, if I use the school computer and I want to log into my email, it's kind of annoying because I have to look it up, the password on my phone, and it's 20 random characters is, is the length of passwords I tend to pick. Uh, and I have to manually type in capital K, lowercase e, you know, exclamation mark, at sign, two, you know, C, capital F, right? And I go through the, the random string, but I have to read it off my phone and type it into my computer, which is a little annoying, right? So that's the one place where it breaks down is if you're on not your computer. But at the same time, you really wouldn't want that random password on that computer anyway. So, um, so I think it's a really good idea. It's something that's it's worth thinking about. Uh, and I would, I would strongly encourage you to think, think that direction, right? The other thing you may have encountered, and this dramatically increases security as well, uh, is a two, what's called a two-factor authentication. Uh, chances are your bank account will do this now. Uh, a lot of really important secure sites will start to do this. Basically what it does is you go to log in, you type your username and your password, and it pops up a thing that says, oh, we need to send you a verification code. We can text it to you or email it to you, right? Or call you and read it to you. You guys have encountered this before, right? Uh, what it does is if you tried to crack somebody's password, or even if you got somebody's password and you knew what it was, right? If you don't physically have their phone and can't text it to you, you know, you can't end up logging in. So it's an extra step. It's really cumbersome. It's annoying to wait for the verification code or whatever, but it's a way of knowing that you're extra secure, right? So it's a good strategy if you can enable it to do it, right? I wouldn't do it on something that is like trying to log into email because it would take forever to do that, right? But something like a bank account, it's not, not a bad idea, okay? So if you want uh, more information, there's a really good article. A lot of the statistics came out of this article. It's a little bit older. Um, that's an Ars Technica article about security and passwords. Um, you can go back and look at the, the link later on if you want. Uh, but it will talk about passwords uh, and hopefully inspire you to start to be a little bit more secure about things. Okay, so enough doom and gloom. We're finished with the doom and gloom. Maybe I've convinced you that passwords are a good idea. Maybe not, right? So let's talk about branding yourself and creating an online identity for yourself, okay? So I want everybody to take a quick break from me talking. I want you to open up your browser and I want you to Google yourself, right? Google your name and see what comes up. Okay. This is your this is your permission to be real to, to be vain and to look at yourself online. Yeah. Um, about passwords. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think it's a matter of time uh, for someone to hack those keychain services where they can then basically <laughs> act as if they're you? And then the, well, okay. A couple things. One, it depends on where you store the information. So if you're storing it locally on your computer and it's not on some um, cloud service somewhere. If you're storing it on your computer, then somebody would physically have to get into your computer to gain access and then try to crack it. So the encryption on the software is very, very heavy for obvious reasons. Um, if you want it to sync back and forth to your phone and you want it to do it via the cloud, you're relying on it being stored on some kind of a server somewhere. And that could be you know, iCloud if you're uh, an Apple person, it could be through Dropbox, it could be through a variety. In which case, you're a little bit susceptible to somebody hacking whatever that account is and then trying to crack the password. So what, what it comes down to is depending on where you're storing it, you have to evaluate is the quality of the encryption on that data sufficient for where it's going to be. Um, and so you can read about these various um, um, 
online services and the level of encryption that they offer. I forget off the top of my head on one password, but I did look into this before I picked it as the one. Uh, but a typical like SSL connection to a server um, would be like a 128-bit encryption or a 256-bit encryption. Uh, the encryption level on this software is like a 2048 or something. So almost 10 or 12 times what a normal and considered to be secure encryption to a bank would be. So they're really encrypting this data to try to protect you. Now, that being said, if somebody were trying to brute force the password to access the data and you picked, you know, FIDO1234, that might not be the right password. So you have to pick a really strong password for what it is. And the password that I have, for example, is a completely random string of letters and numbers that I've just chosen to memorize. And it's uh, 16 characters. And so it took time to figure out how to memorize that. And I had to write it down for a while. And, and now it's just second nature because that's my master password. Uh, but it's completely random string of numbers. That's the master password. Uh, so if somebody had access to my computer, let's say I left the room and you stole my computer, right? Don't you dare. No. <laughs> let's say you did that. If that were the case, you'd have to crack my master password. And even if you brute forced it, I picked 16 characters so we can, that's a long set and it's completely random. So I'm trying to protect myself that way. But theoretically, somebody could crack that and then have access to everything. But is that any better than writing them all down in a notebook somewhere and having somebody steal the notebook? Not necessarily. You have to kind of weigh that. Okay, okay so you all Googled yourself, right? How many people found yourself as the first result? Good job, right? That means you're actually doing something or you have a unique enough name to where people don't, uh, there's not a lot of other people. So um, a while ago, I don't think this is true anymore, but if you Googled me, the first result was uh, Grant Adams, the dating guru, <laughs> um, which, believe it or not, was not me. Uh, and so one of the problems with this online world is that all too often, right, we're subject to, let's say we go to get a job, right? Uh, you go, you interview with a you know, search firm and you're trying to get a job. You go to a company and you're trying to get a job. What happens, right? They interview you. They kind of like you. The first thing they do is say, hmm, I wonder if this person has a Facebook account. I wonder if this person... Uh, you know, has any kind of online identity. I wonder if they've done anything a little bit sketchy, right? So what do they do? They try to look up that information, right? If you have a wide open Facebook page where you'll accept anybody, that's real easy to see you, right? If you, if you have an online presence, right, that's a good thing, right? Especially if you control it. If, however, they're looking at, at trying to find you and they find the dating guru, right, it might not match up correctly, right? The dating guru is not that big a deal. You could probably figure out that it's not, uh, you know, it's not me. But the same, the, the, it could be something really bad, right? Heaven forbid they look up your name and you're a porn star or whatever, right? That could theoretically disrupt your ability to get a job, right? So what do we do about that? We want to find a way, right, to brand yourself and, and get to the point where if somebody looks you up, they can actually find you. Right? And you have to actively do that right? versus letting Google determine it for you. Right? And that's, that's the big problem, is if you don't do anything, Google will decide who you are. Right? And, and I guess, theoretically, one of the other search engines could too. Right? But Google's the big one. Okay, so what do we do? How do we establish um, our, our online presence? So the first thing is you can create a website for yourself, which always helps. Right? But you can also start to be consistent with what your online, let's call it username slash handle slash whatever you want to call it, uh, is across a variety of sites. So you pick something that represents you, hopefully it's related to your name, and you try to use that across a variety of sites to help brand yourself, right? If you buy a domain name, right, the advantage is you control that name, right? So for example, I own grantadams.net, I own it. Right? Therefore, whatever goes on that page is something that I control. If you go there right now, it's nothing. It's, it, it used to be a website, but I, my servers crashed, and I just never set it back up. So it doesn't really matter. But the point is, I own it, and I control what's on that page. Right? If you don't want to do that, it costs about 12 bucks a year to do that, plus hosting. Right? If you don't do that, you still want to kind of control who you are as an online presence, and there are some services that will help you do that, and we're going to go through that today. 
So we'll talk a little bit about domain names. If you were going to choose to buy one yourself, um, it should somehow reflect who you are, right? Uh, it can be up to 67 characters in length, though the longer the domain name, the harder it is to um, type in. Digital Tools for Architects is a bit long, right? I've tried to shorten it a number of times, like DTFA and whatever, but they're all bought, so we stick with Digital Tools for Architects or Digital Tools for Designers, right? Shorter generally, generally is better, right? There are a variety of um, basically the ends of domains, right? The dot coms so to speak. .com obviously being the most common, though most of them are purchased, right? But there are a variety of other ones, and actually there's a whole bunch that are coming out right now. They decided to sell off a bunch more. Um, and so you can pick one of those. The problem is most people automatically type .com because that's the most common one, so they tend to do that. So if, for example, um, you tried to register grantadams.com and it wasn't available, um, and you registered grantadams.net, Right? If somebody were looking for you, they might try grantadams.com first right? before they said, oh, that's not right, let me go to grantadams.net. Uh, and so that's something to be aware of. Right? If you're interested in a website, you can just type it in and see if it exists somewhere else. Right? If somebody else already has the website or it goes somewhere as opposed to I can't find this page, then um, chances are somebody else owns it and it's probably not for sale. Right? If it goes into oblivion and you don't get a website back, chances are it might be available, in which case you can go to a domain name registrar uh, and actually choose to buy that domain name. Okay, And you basically, you rent it for a set period of time. You buy it for a set period of time. A year is the, the, the shortest amount of time, and I think you can buy it for up to 10 years. Right? Um, you can also select a hosting package uh, that, that deals with the, the server side of it, so it goes somewhere. Um, a lot of times you can also map it to a free service. So let's say you have a WordPress blog, you can choose to have your domain name go to that WordPress blog um, instead. So registrars, if you're interested in doing something like this, um, again, this is not required for the class, but I like, like to, to point it out. Uh, Namecheap is probably the cheapest one out there uh, that's a reasonably good quality. That's the one I use. Um, there are a variety of others. You guys have probably seen like Super Bowl commercials for GoDaddy before, kind of ridiculous. Um, that's one of these online register, reg, registrars. Uh, and there's a variety of others. Right? The other thing is choosing your username to correspond with your domain name. Right? If, you're, if you're trying to brand yourself um, uh, as something particular, right? So um, maybe the username I tend to use is 270photos, right? For any of my photography related stuff, I have 270photos.com, but then my Flickr account is 270photos. And uh, my, you know, uh, whatever, uh, all of my, those kinds of accounts, I try to brand the same way, right? Just one way of doing it. You want to stay away from weird fads and, you know, like there was a trend for a long time about um, eliminating vowels out of words. Flickr is one of the examples, right? You drop the last E, right? There was a variety of websites that started doing this. It's really annoying down the road because you have to remember, oh, that's one of those websites that drops the vowel. It's not actually Flickr. You know, Flickr is a big enough example uh, where you're not going to necessarily not know how to spell it because it's kind of a brand in and of itself now. But if you did it you're on, your, on your own and you told somebody what your website is, they might not know to drop the last E or whatever. You want to claim your news username across sites, right? Chances are you've already done this. Um, when I first wrote this lecture, it was very early in the world of uh, online. Recognize I've been teaching this class for eight years, right? Go back eight years ago, people didn't have usernames across a variety of sites yet. Uh, there were two websites that helped you check to see if a username was available across a variety of sites. Um, Namecheck and Noam both do that. Um, if, you, if this is something you're interested in, it's actually optional in part two of your exercise today. You can actually go to one of these websites and see where your username has been registered or not. Right? It's more interesting now than relevant, uh, but it's there. Right? So then we move on to probably the, the most important thing that you can do for free to help brand yourself online, and that is creating what's called a personal landing page, or a PLP. Uh, and what that does is it's a page that is completely under your control, that's done for free through one of these services um, that kind of manages your online identity and gives you a place to point people that says, hey, this is all the content that's about me, right? So if you go to an employer and you want to show them a link to your portfolio and you want to tell them more about yourself, 
right? If you have a personal landing page and you give them that web address, they'll get all the information that's about you that you control, right? Which is a really good thing. So it allows you to actively manage your online identity. It allows you to claim stuff that belongs to you and bring it in, right? And it also controls how the internet sees you, right? And, and it gives you that, that grain of control, right? So there's a variety of places that make this easy. Um, the one that we're going to use today is a, is a website called flavors.me. Uh, it's great because it's really graphic and you get a great looking site out of it. Um, generally, the results are really positive, And so I'm going to encourage you to do that. You can also set up a Google Plus account, right, or a Facebook account that kind of brands yourself. I'm not um, a big fan of Facebook and kind of how that evolves. Um, I think it's really easy to get overly friendly <laughs> with people and just accept friends. Uh, I will warn you all right now, if you try to friend me on Facebook, I won't friend you until you've graduated from here. Uh, because I think that's a, that's a place where it's reasonable for me to become your friend. Um, but that's the kind of thing that you have to be kind of careful of in terms of who do you want to be your friends and you know how into it are you. I think doing something outside of Facebook, outside of the walled garden is a good idea and that's why we're going to kind of emphasize the flavors.me page. Uh, it's more public um, and it's, it's a better uh, representation of yourself than something that's inside Facebook. It's also graphically a little bit more fun. Right? So here's a variety of the flavors.me pages. Um, you can look at previous student examples as well. Very easy to create, uh, but they're very custom, right? You can tell that there's a certain theme to it uh, where you get your name, you get uh, a little tagline about yourself, and then you have some links, right, and a photographic background. But you can customize this a lot to, to suit who you are and your personality, uh, and I think that can be a really good uh, strategy for this, right, uh, depending on your interest. Uh, and part of the reason I cycle through a bunch of these is you can really see how, how diverse they can become. Right. Okay, so the next thing is to get your name out there. So, does anybody know how to improve their Google search results? Right. There's no exact realistic answer to that because Google won't tell you because they don't want you to game the system. Right. But one of the big ways of, of kind of improving Google's understanding of who you are right, is to, every time you make a post, have a link that references who you are, right? So let's say you create a personal landing page, okay? And then you list your personal landing page, right, next to your name when you post all of your digital tools stuff in this class, okay? Google, because it crawls the website every day or so, every couple hours or so, right, will start to associate this post with this person and this link. Right? And the more your link shows up, the higher your search results are in Google. Right? So you want to cross-reference. Right? So if you have, let's say, a YouTube account, or if you have a Vimeo account and you produce that, if you have a, um, you know, you, we will all have the digital tools site. Right? Wherever you produce online content, you want to make sure you update that account right, with this link. Because every time you make a post, it'll start to cross-reference you and your personal landing page with the content that you've created, right? And I'll show you how to do this on our course, course website, okay? The other thing that I have to mention, and we talked a little bit about Facebook, is a lot of you are in a stage in your lives where you don't necessarily have things that you're thinking about down the road, right? You're going out uh, and partying with your friends, you're having a great time, you might take a few photos or somebody might take a few photos of you. They might throw them up on Facebook. It's really funny, right? That sort of thing. I'm very, very thankful that when I was in college, this stuff didn't really exist <laughs> because there, there were a few moments uh, that were probably not particularly flattering um, that happened along the way that there aren't photos of and there's no record. So I don't have to share those with you, luckily, right? Um, there, there are, however, problems, and I'll use an example uh, in my own personal life on my Facebook page, which, again, I'm not going to be friends with you until you graduate, so I don't have to be that scared just yet. Um, anybody done beta breakers before? Nobody has done beta breakers in here? Really? Wow. Yeah, okay. So anyway, beta breakers is a, is a running race that's in San Francisco. Um, 
it has cleaned up in recent years from what it was, but it was basically a roving party through San Francisco where everybody was really drunk and had a good time. Um, kind of gross in a way. But anyway, um, there was a year when my wife and I decided to do this before we had kids and before all of the you know life stuff happened. Uh, and we and a group of friends decided to dress up like a marching band, and we bought these uniforms that were from... Lee Summit High School in Missouri or something. And we all dressed up as these marching band people, and we were all rather um, intoxicated during this uh, event. And to this day, there are some pictures on Facebook of me in a band uniform, rather intoxicated, right? Nothing particularly bad, but at the same time, probably not the most professional things, okay? The problem with this is that those photos, and they're not photos I posted. They're photos some of my friends posted and tagged me in. Okay, so they show up in my Facebook as me, which they are me, right? But I don't have control of them, right? And I use this as the example of you have to be really careful inside the world of Facebook in that whatever is posted of you or tagged of you, it's really hard to get rid of, okay? So it starts to brand you as who you are. So let's say that you're applying for a job somewhere, right? And you have some really inappropriate photos that somebody's tagged you in on Facebook, right? If you suddenly become friends with the person who's hiring you on Facebook, which they probably will ask to be, right? If you suddenly do that and they start to look at these pictures and they say, well, wait a minute, I don't know if I want to hire this person, right? That's a problem. And so whenever you post something to social media, think twice about is this really an appropriate thing for me to post because it doesn't go away, right? Once it's submitted, it's out there and you can't retract it. Right? And I think there's been movies about this kind of stuff and whatever where somebody accidentally posts something and then they can't get rid of it anymore. Right? So you have to be aware of this kind of thing because it can happen. So be careful with what you post is, is, my, is my message there. Okay? So what else can you do with the domain name? You buy a domain name, what can you do? You can set up email specific to you right? so you no longer have you know, grant at gmail.com. Not that you could get that. Um, you, know, you don't have grant you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten at gmail.com, right? You can have grant at digitaltoolsforarchitects.com, right? It's a very professional way of branding yourself, right? You might, you might, uh, let's say you have a grantadams.net, it might be grant at grantadams.net, right, as your email. Um, in the old days, Google used to, to do this for free, um, where you could map, you could basically have Gmail, uh, but it would map to your domain name. Uh, they stopped allowing you to do it for free. It costs $5 a month now. I guess they decided making money was a good thing. Um, there is, however, a free service. It's called Zoho that will do basically the same thing, give you all the same features. Uh, it will give you email and that sort of thing. Uh, so if you have a domain name, it's a good thing to do is to set it up. Um, so you can generally buy this through a hosting provider. You can do it through Google Apps, uh, which is $5 a, a user per month. Uh, or you can go through uh, Zoho, which will do it for free. Uh, free is always good. Uh, generally, what's available in these kinds of accounts, it's going to be email, it's going to be a calendar, it's going to be some kind of an online office suite. Um, and depending on which service, there might be more or, or less offered. Right? So what you want to switch from uh, is being a, a, a content creator. You want to focus on building content rather than building websites. Um, and so how do you kind of do that? You have your domain name. What are you going to do with it? Okay. Generally, you're going to build some kind of a website out of it, right? Um, and this is probably a little bit for the people who really get into this. You either really like web design stuff or you don't, right? If you don't like it, you stick with the personal landing page. If you do like it, you push it a step further. Um, it's Part of the reason that I talk about this is a lot of the people that end up in the world of architecture kind of like web design. It's kind of a related field. And so this kind of stuff ends up being interesting. So I feel it's worth talking about. So if you want to have a website, first thing that you have to do is buy hosting somewhere. And basically, you're renting space on a computer that's connected to the internet that will serve up the content that you want to, to serve up. Um, the server lives in a room that looks something like that. It's basically an air-conditioned box, and there's a bunch of computers in it, right? In, in an ideal way, right? Um, it's, it's in some kind of a very secure building, right? Like I said, the digital tools one is in Florida, and it's in the Federal Reserve Building, right? They rent out the basement of the Federal Reserve Building for this. Uh, the good news is it's armed guards protect it, right? which is nice. Um, but it also, um, you know, in, in my case, if there was a hurricane, I might lose, you know, some data, 
um, because it's in Florida and I have to be aware of that. Uh, depending on where it's, it's uh, configured, you have more or less um, you know, risk for those kinds of things. Anyway, um, so you pay somebody and you rent the server. Uh, there are scales of what you can do, right? If you're just starting out as an as a early user, you're not using very much data or bandwidth um, for your particular server, you don't have a particularly large website, you can get away with a couple bucks a month, right? It can be really cheap. And you can go all the way up to hundreds and hundreds of dollars a month if you're hosting a big website that gets a lot of traffic and, and that sort of thing, right? I have a, a hosting plan that's kind of right in the middle. Uh, it's actually, uh, a, I, I, I own the whole server itself um, because I have enough uh, resources, enough people accessing the site to where the, the lower end plans couldn't cover it anymore. Uh, I don't use a lot of bandwidth, but I have a lot of activity because all of you log on at the same time. Uh, and I've fought servers and I've changed hosting companies a million times and whatever. Anyway, the one I have right now seems to be working. So, so if you don't want to pay, uh, there are free options out there. WordPress.com is a great one. Blogger is similar. Um, it it um, doesn't always require a domain name. You can just have a, a username. So it's WordPress.com slash whatever it is. Uh, they'll host it for free. You can have your own website. Life is good. Um, generally the idea there is that you're moving beyond having to do any of this hosting stuff on your own and you can focus on creating the content itself okay if you're gonna start a website right the easiest thing to do would be to start what's called a blog it doesn't even have to look like a blog the digital tools site is technically a blog right even though it doesn't really look like it um, but that's kind of the idea um, it requires very little coding uh, a lot of times the, the look and feel of it is all uh, easily customizable. You don't have to do anything fancy, right? You can code your own hand, website by hand. The first time I taught this class, we actually built websites and we built them by hand in Dreamweaver, right? And that was in uh, what, 2007, right? So things have changed a lot. We don't, don't waste our time doing that anymore. Um, but it was something that, that was important at the time. There was a lot of trend toward doing that. Now we barely uh, would open Dreamweaver anymore. Um, you can use a content management system, uh, which is a much bigger website, something like the DVC website or um, you know, other institutional sites would use something like a con content management website um, because it's a bit broader, bit more robust, that sort of thing. You could develop your own PHP MySQL website, which is the coding language behind it. Um, if it's something you're interested in, you probably need to take a coding class to learn it. Uh, I can actually uh, read and write PHP and HTML uh, and MySQL because I taught myself to do it because I was interested in doing it. I had a, had a small business for a while that did this. Anyway, um, and you could ultimately do a Flash or an ActionScript website that tends to be more interactive, though the world of Steve Jobs, post Steve Jobs, and Apple has basically killed off Flash because they won't support it on any of their iDevices, so their iPhones and their uh, iPads. So we've moved on to something called HTML5, which has basically re replaced it, but given you a lot of the same functionality. Um, so there's examples. Digital Tools for Architects is a good example. Um, there's another one um, out of Berkeley. Uh, there's a kite photography. I don't even know if it's still up anymore. The guy who used to do it, the professor, is retired, so I don't know if he does it anymore. Um, <laughs> if you run across a really bad website, chances are it was hand-coded. <laughs> Um, and there's, there's a couple examples of uh, Drupal sites. Uh, there's a P PHP MySQL site up there. Anyway, you can get the idea. Uh, the languages, uh, these are basically the code that you have to write for the browser to interpret. Uh, HTML is the most common, um, kind of the easiest one to do. JavaScript builds on that and does some of the interactive features of it. Uh, XML is a way of kind of classifying and storing data. I took a class in XML for a while. Um, PHP MySQL is a combination of a coding language and a database. So all of the content, uh, the, the digital tool site is an example of a PHP MySQL site. Um, there's a bunch of code that says go get information from the database and fill the page up with the database information, right? Which is why it's dynamic. What you guys post will then show up as your post, right? It goes and gets your information, goes and gets your photo, drops it into the site, right? Uh, and then Flash and Action Script is another um, so this is what they look like, uh, in case you were interested. Uh, that's an HTML example. Uh, this is a PHP MySQL example. A lot more calls to um, the database that says, go look up this information and fill it in. Right? In all likelihood, you're going to pick the first option. You're going to do something simple. Um, it's easy to maintain. 
uh, and it will help you create that online presence. Right? Uh, we can move on, that's fine. Uh, setting it up is really easy, um, even if you want to run it yourself. Um, you just set up, you follow the instructions, it's less than five minutes to set up one of these websites. Right? But the idea is that you don't spend time working on the website itself, you spend time working on the content that goes on the website. Right? People won't go to the website unless there's good stuff to read on it. Right? Um, so you want to make sure you focus on that content. And so what do we do on a personal landing page? We find a way for you to pull the content that you're creating at a variety of sites onto the one page that represents you so that it always has updated and current content makes it interesting for people to read, uh, which is what we'll talk about. Right? Um, since this is the last day of, of me being able to spit stuff at you not related to Photoshop and whatever, I'm going to throw a couple more things that I think are really cool that uh, might be worth looking at. Uh, the first one is LinkedIn. Uh, how many people have a LinkedIn profile? Right. I'm always surprised at how few people do. Uh, after today, you all will, which is great. Uh, LinkedIn is, is the one, let's call it a social network, that I actually think has some validity to it. Um, it's not the Facebook of keeping track of the friends that you used to have in high school or whatever. Uh, it's actually meant for the professional world. It's meant for um, you to kind of build an online resume that represents you and what you've done with it, um, which works really nicely. And it also allows you to connect to people and get people to uh, endorse you for certain skills. Um, I will invite you all to connect to me today if you want to. Um, such that I can then endorse your skills after we go through Photoshop and that sort of thing. I can endorse and say, yes, you do know what you're doing in Photoshop. Right? Um, so this is my profile page um, that gives you basic information about who I am, what I do, what my degrees are, that sort of thing. Uh, you'll be creating something very similar to this uh, today. Uh, Mailbox is an app for your, your phone that helps you manage your email. I think it's fantastic, but I had to show it, share it with you because I love it. Um, it lets you use gesture-based swipes to quickly archive email or defer email for later time, uh, which is fantastic. Um, so somebody like me, I probably get somewhere between 200 and 500 emails a day. It's really hard to get through them. Um, but if I use something like this, gesture-based, it makes life really easy. I can quickly say, I know I don't need to read that, and it's just a flick, right? And you go through. You can also say, wait, I need to defer this and go back, um, put it off till tomorrow, bring it back up in a week, whatever it is, uh, it lets you defer really easily. It kind of helps keep track of your email. Anyway, oh, it's really cool. When you have zero in your inbox, it shows you a random photo from Instagram. It's kind of fun. It's like a reward for getting a z inbox zero. Anyway, Google Voice is another thing that I think is really great. It's kind of an undersung thing that uh, Google offers for free. Um, the phone number that I gave all of you is actually a Google Voice number. It's not my cell phone, right? That's to protect my actual cell phone number. But at the same time, I can get your phone calls forwarded to me, and I can also get your text messages forwarded to me. Um, so it's basically like having a second number that I can give away uh, and not worry about. If I were putting things on, uh, you know, where I might get telemarketing calls and whatever, uh, I will give them the Google Voice number, and then I can set up blacklists of if it's coming from these numbers, I don't want to get it, right? There's also a communal blacklist of all the, um, like, telemarketer numbers, so you can blacklist that number. So it works really nicely. Um, it will also transcribe a voicemail into uh, text and then email it to you or text it to you so you don't actually have to listen to the voicemail. You can get the transcription of it. Uh, and all that's for free. So quick review before we move on. Uh, you wanna, if you want, you can buy a unique domain name. Uh, you want to point that domain name to something that you control, either a website or a personal landing page. Right? You can set up Google services or email services for your domain. So you have grant at digitaltoolsforarchitects.com. Uh, and that sort of thing. And then you update all of your profiles to reflect that information so that you cross-link your life online. And that's how you get a better online presence. Okay? So, uh, we've run through that. I'm going to switch over here. Let's see if I can stop recording. Hold on. Where's the little recording thing? Okay, so we're going to continue on today with uh, exercise 103, uh, walking through establishing this online identity. Uh, before I did that, though, I wanted to finish up with the Dropbox thing from last class uh, because obviously my computer got stuck and didn't finish restarting, so I wanted to actually walk through a few things. Um, so Dropbox is installed on, on my flash drive. I just plugged my flash drive in for the first time. Unfortunately, you can't automatically run Dropbox when you plug in your flash drive. Windows blocks that feature. Um, so when I first plug in my flash drive, what I need to do 
is I need to open my flash drive, and then I need to actually draw, uh, launch the Dropbox portable application. So this is what we use to install it, but it's now switched over to, to running Dropbox. So I'll go ahead and double click on it, uh, and that will start the application. And I'll wait here, and in the lower right in just a second, this Dropbox icon is going to be substituted for the red one that I created during the installation, and then I'll know that Dropbox is actually working. So I wanted to point out that every time you plug in your flash drive, you actually have to start Dropbox for the backup to happen, right? And you want to be aware of that. Um, so there it is, right? Dropbox is now installing, and it's going ahead and syncing the data that's inside my Dropbox folder on my flash drive, which is what I want. If you go to eject your flash drive and it won't let you eject it, right? Quit Dropbox, and you can do that by right-clicking on or uh, clicking on the Dropbox icon, clicking on this little um, gear and saying exit Dropbox, and then eject your flash drive. Okay? So, we will continue on. Uh, first thing that we're going to do is go to LinkedIn, right, and log into your LinkedIn. Uh, and I probably should have already logged in. I think this is me. Yeah, there I am. Right? And I should probably sign in. Yeah. So this is where password manager is problematic. <laughs> I have to look up the password, sorry. Bear with me for a second. So, I've logged in um, to my profile here. Um, we'll go back to home for just a second. Uh, if I click on profile, right, it's going to show me my profile. Um, it's also going to uh, tell you if you've been endorsed by anybody. And what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go through and edit your profile. And if it's the first time you've ever done LinkedIn and you sign up, it'll walk you through a lot of steps to help you set things up. Uh, but it basically, right now, I could go in and I could edit any of these little tags that are about me. I can edit the summary. We can come down here to experience, right? I can edit uh, any of these variety of things that I've done, okay? As you start to create this, um, you, you'll start to build it. We can see your profile strength here. How complete is your profile, right? You'll start out at the bottom and you'll keep working your way up until you have a complete uh, thing. The other thing is you can add people. Um, so there's a little plus icon, add connections. Oh, look. Right, there you are, right? So I can accept that. Um, looks like there's a couple other of you. And so I'll go ahead and start to connect you. Um, you can also see um, your, all of your connections. Right, these are all people that I know. A lot of these being students that I've had before. Right, and so I can look through and I can see what people are doing. I can get contact information uh, to be able to e email them and that sort of thing, okay? So I'm going to ask you for the first part of this to go ahead and work through uh, your um, LinkedIn profile. It should take you about a half hour to work through it, right? Then the next part that we're going to do, and I'm going to skip ahead to do that part right now so you can see it, uh, is we're going to go to your flavors.me um, to create your landing page. Actually, I skipped part two because it's kind of irrelevant right now. Um, and we'll go to flavors.me. And I'll warn you ahead of time that the flavors.me page sometimes has some issues when you're first signing up if all 30 plus of you try to do it at once. Uh, I've run into that problem before. So you just have to be a little bit patient. Uh, you're going to click on the Get Started for Free, uh, which will allow you to uh, go ahead and log in and create, create and share your digital world. It would be nice if it would let me do it. Try to log in and then go to sign up. There we go. 
Uh, so I already have my uh, site. Uh, so this is mine, right? Uh, and basically, we have the ability to change stuff. So if I look at, uh, if I look over here on the right, when you're logged in, you have uh, this is where you can change your things. Uh, first thing is information, right? Let's me put my name in, and then it lets me say what's basically going to go over here. As I edit things, um, you know, like if I added Pleasant Hill, right, it would show up over here on the right. Does that kind of make sense? You're going to go to flavors.me. Uh, I probably need to open a second web browser here. Hold on. So flavors.me, and for whatever reason, the get started for free link didn't work for me. So click on the login link, and then at the bottom there's a sign up for free, assuming you don't already have it. And then you can put your email address. The username is is going to be flavors.me slash whatever. And so like I picked Grant Adams, right? So it's a, it's a simple uh, pick that. Then you pick a password and you confirm your password, right? And then you go ahead and click get started. Okay. And that'll take you to a page that looks similar like this. Yours won't look like this right away. It'll be like a blank color behind, right? And you'll have some text. You'll you'll spend some time customizing it. It's pretty intuitive. Uh, but under about, this is where I'm putting the basic information, you know, my, my title here, uh, and then kind of a sub about paragraph. Right. Notice that I can make things bold. I can italicize things. Uh, so I have I can put links in. I've got some a variety here. Okay. Um, so I'm done with information. Contact. Right. This is a premium feature. You'll run across this. I'm not asking you to sign up for premium features. So we don't need to do that. Um, links. If you wanted to put a link, uh, that's right here. Digital tools for architects. Right. I could add uh, more links. Right. Like. For example, I could do my company. So if I can type. Right, and I can click save. Right, and it would change my link to be my company. It just depends on what you're after. Right? Um, we'll go back to digital tools. Okay, so I'll go ahead and click save. There it is. Now we'll go back here. Um, we can kind of continue on here. Uh, again, there's a lot of premium features. I think this is might be a premium. It just shows where this stuff goes. Um, anyway, next thing is to come to the content section. Right, and the content section uh, will it'll allow you five, I believe, as a free account. If you want more than that, you have to pay. Um, this is kind of the freemium model of uh, internet services. Right, where you get the basic stuff for free. If you want more, you pay. Right, uh, I'm not asking you to pay, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, if you if you click on add, uh, and there's actually a tutorial that will help you go through this. Um, this is where you're going to want to add certain services. And so if I wanted LinkedIn, for example, let me go ahead and uh, kill off LinkedIn so I can show you this. Right? I'll click on Add, and it's going to look, and it has a list of services that I've used bef that, that they have access to. So I'm going to pick LinkedIn, right? and it's going to say Connect to LinkedIn, and it's going to go to LinkedIn and say, are you sure you want to connect these two together? And I say yes. Go ahead. You can do it. And now it's authorized LinkedIn. And if I am, t if I click on LinkedIn here, right, I'll get my LinkedIn profile. Uh, that's all the stuff about me. Okay. Similarly, you can connect it to things like Twitter, right? So you can see all of your tweets in one place. I can connect it to my Vimeo account that shows a lot of the videos that I posted. Um, 
right? I post some videos on Vimeo. I also post some videos on YouTube so I can connect it to YouTube. There's all my YouTube videos, right? So it's pulling the content from other places that I posted it and bringing it onto this website. Uh, I also can pull content from the Digital Tools site itself. Uh, and this one's a little bit more compli complicated to do, but here's all of the posts that I've made recently. Right? I don't make as many posts as you. Yours will, will come up with a lot more um, posts than mine. So when we're doing that, uh, the best thing to do is to follow the Digital Tools um, tutorial that walks through this. And it's under flavors.me. It's 0 0.12. Right? And this is the tricky part. In step seven, right, you're going to be adding by an RSS feed because obviously I'm not connected to the flavors people and they don't have my website in here. But we can add it by RSS. Uh, and what you're going to do is you're going to copy this address right here and replace this bold where it says author name with whatever your username is for the, the site. Right? So I have two. Um, my, the one that I use to, to do trial posts like you guys do as students is grant.adams, right? It's whatever I use to log in, right? Uh, so I would take this and I would copy it, but I would replace where it says author name with grant.adams, right? Um, so you just want to do that. This we will copy, and I'll go ahead and show you this. And I'm going to have to delete, hold on. Go ahead and delete the digital tools here. And then let me go ahead and add it. Right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to go for the RSS feed, which is right here. And then I'm going to paste in that address. Right? And I'm going to look for where it says author name right here. And I'm going to replace that with whatever my username is on the digital tool site. So grant.adams in this case. And then I'll click connect and it will add the feed and it usually takes a little bit to populate and there it is. Okay. Now re recognize that I can edit some stuff here so if we go back to manage right I can go in and I can edit this and it'll let me see how that has that weird character in it. We want it to go back to an and character and then I can go ahead and close that uh, and that fixes it over here. Okay, so then we can come down to design, right? And this is where we can pick different layouts. And this is why I really like this website because they have a lot of stuff that's just kind of built into it. If I wanted um, my site to show up with my content in the center, I could do that. Uh, I could change it so that it's on the left, right? I could change it, let's see, right over there. It's tall and skinny in that case. And we can come down here, we could do it. Right, kind of in the center here. Right, and then we get to the premium options. Right, we do the widescreen centered. Right, so you got a lot of flexibility. Right, so those are under layouts. Then we can also go to backgrounds. Right, and this is where you can upload background images. So I've uploaded some already. Um, you can you can click on upload a background and upload something that works for you. Um, so depending on what the look is that you were going for, you can obviously change uh, the background image. Right, I can change the background image. So I can change the look of this page pretty dramatically uh, and pretty easily. Okay, So this is the one that I had. Let me go back to my design layouts. Right, let me go back to, I forget which one I had. I think it's right there. Right. Um, so we did that. You can also change colors. Right, so there are color palettes that you can pick from, um, or you can actually customize, which is what I think I've done, um, so that you can customize. Do you want your, um, you know, your your name to be a particular color, um, and kind of body and whatever? Does that kind of make sense? Okay, so a lot of this is just playing around with it. Um, you can change fonts right, if you want it to look differently. This is this is what I picked. If I wanted it to be something different, right, I can scroll through this list and I can pick you know, whatever it is that I wanted it to be, and then everything changes, right? It's probably not the most attractive in the world. No, whatever. So you can play around with it a little bit. 
Um, so there are a variety of options um, for you to set this stuff up in. Now, uh, I have an address here, grantadams.flavors.me, right, or flavors.me slash grantadams. Um, either of those will work there. I'm going to go ahead and copy this address, and then I'm going to go back to the digital tool site, and I actually haven't logged in yet. So let me go ahead and log in. Okay, now I've had this happen where sometimes you get this, uh, this error thing. I'm still trying to figure out why it happens. If you just click the logo, the please log in logo, it, it did already log you in and it'll just take you to the main page. And I don't know why that's doing that, but for whatever reason it's having issues. So let me go ahead and go back to that tutorial. Didn't log in. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to go to my dashboard and I'm going to go to my profile here. Right? And then as we scroll down here, right, you can see that I have my, my contact email here, and then I, under website, I can put my personal landing page, which is that grantadams.flavors.me, right? and I can paste that in place. Uh, obviously, I already have it there. Right? As I continue down here, right, I can put in my LinkedIn. Right? If I had a Twitter, I could put that. If I had Facebook and wanted to put it, I could. If I had a Flickr account, I could put it there. Right, you can see that it connects all of these various services. Right? So what this does, and when I'm done, I'll click update my profile. It will take any of the posts that I make. And on the right side of my post, right, it, it has my name, it has my little profile picture, right? And it has two links home page and my LinkedIn, right? So when Google crawls this page and sees that, yes, this is exercise 201, it's been it's by Grant Adams here, it associates this same content. There's my website, there's my LinkedIn, okay? If you, if you go forward, and let me jump over to one of these, uh, in my other account, be nice if I had more, um, anyway, in this in this particular example, I have a little Twitter icon. So the more of these that you have, the more of the little icons that you'll have, and the more you start to be cross-linked, which is the idea. So I'm asking you to set up your flavors.me page and your LinkedIn profile. Make sure that your LinkedIn profile is connected to your flavors.me, right? And then go to the digital tool site and add your at least your personal landing page and your LinkedIn so that it will show up here in the right sidebar for every post that you make. Make sense? Yeah? Okay. So I'll be around to help you. Uh, once you're done with that, uh, we're done for today. Um, so I'll turn you loose.